Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you don't recognize me, my name is Pete. I'm glad to be with you guys this morning. I'm the associate pastor here at the church, and uh, it's nice to be with you and uh, watch Misty's story. Uh, just an incredible moment for us to celebrate together. Um, so I don't, if you've been paying attention to the, the, the snow situation in California, it's been kind of a, a crazy situation that's been happening out there. Amazingly, in California, they've gotten about 50 feet of snow. Here's some pictures of some of the snow that's been happening out there. In fact, um, when I did this research on Tuesday, they uh, were still currently under about 12 feet of snow. Look at this house. It's like you can't even see around it. Um, it's interesting because when snow starts falling here, it feels like a magical moment. We always want it to fall. For them, it became really kind of a nightmare because in some mountain communities, they actually were trapped in their houses for like two weeks. Um, some of them, interestingly enough, were in this community. I just read an article about this this week. They were in this community where there was a grocery store. It was their only grocery store they had access to. And when the snow started falling, the roof collapsed in that grocery store. And so they had no access to food. And many of them had no access to heat, to electric, to um, food, medicine, anything. In fact, some of them are walking out saying, help us. Uh, they were trapped for so long, the, their houses became like dark holes of nightmares. It was crazy for them to experience that for that period of time. And it's interesting because I think there's so many things that we take for granted on a regular basis. I actually just had recently had an opportunity to talk to my aunt. My aunt just turned 94 this week. So she's getting close to 100. I think she's going to get there. She's still living by herself. She mows her yard um, in the summertime. She, she's just an incredible lady. But she's seen so much change. Uh, and as I think about things that I take for granted on a regular basis, it was just really interesting to talk to her and find out a little bit of her perspective. So she grew up on a farm just outside of Charlottesville, between Charlottesville and Burnville. And on that farm, she actually had, uh, when she was telling me her story, she had no running water on the inside of her house. In fact, that wasn't even really a thing at that point in time. She was growing up in the 1930s. So she had no running water in her house. She had to go outside to use an outhouse for the bathroom. They had this, like, faucet thing outside where they would pump water, and that's the only way they could get water inside their house. She had no electricity inside of her house. They also had no home heating. So they lived in a two-story farmhouse with no home heating except for one thing. That was their kitchen stove that they had inside the house. That was the only form of heating. So consequently, when they had to take a bath and take care of themselves that way, they would heat water up on that stove, and then they would take a bath by the stove because it was the only warm place in the house. They said when, they were, when they'd go to bed at night, they had to huddle together. They had some carpet rollers they, they would roll out to try and kill some of the drafts in the house. But it was just incredible to hear about all those different things because there's so much that our modern life is built on. There's a, a foundation of legwork that has been done that we, we get to experience the simplicity and the freedoms that we enjoy right now because of all the legwork that has been done. It's crazy to me because that was only 94 years ago and less than 100 years. But it got me thinking about all the foundations, all the legwork that's been done for us to live the lives of simplicity that we get to live now. One way I was thinking about that is just the electricity that we all enjoy and depend on. Electricity is like a backbone of our society, but it really started when this guy, Benjamin Franklin, I'm sorry this picture is pixelated, it's because it's so old from the 1700s, but in 1700s, Benjamin Franklin walks outside with a kite and a string and a key and discovers how to harness the power of electricity. But it wasn't until 130 years later, there was a guy by the name of Michael Faraday who came along. Michael Faraday, um, he actually discovered this idea of electro, that's not the right picture, you can just stay on the other one for a, for a second here. He discovered the idea of electromagnetic induction, and that harnessed the ability to make uh, mass-produce electricity and deliver it into people's homes. But it wasn't until 19, I believe it was 1908, um, yeah, 1908, when Thomas A. Edison came along, and he discovered how to take an electric filament light bulb and turn that into light. And then it was picked up by some other company, the Electric Light Company, and mass distributed, and you could buy one at the time for $1. For us, that's equal to $23, but at the time, that was a full day's wage. I just look at how far we've come with electricity since then and how much we depend on it. Here's another one for you. The, uh, 
the transportation that we depend on on a regular basis. It really began with a guy by the name of Joseph Aston. He was an Englishman, and he, he discovered how to put together Portland cement, and he paved the first road in England that had ever been paved. And think about that, because we depend on all these streets that we drive around on, but he came up with the first one of those, and that was in 1824. And then right here in Pennsylvania in 1859, we dug our first oil well in the United States in Pennsylvania, which paved the road to the distilling process for gasoline, modern gasoline. And then Carl Benz came along in 1836. This is that picture here. He came up with the motor, uh, I think he called it the motor wagon. This is the first gas-powered automobile. But then a few years later, a guy by the name of Henry Ford came along. You might recognize his name. And he came up with this idea. It was called a quadricycle. It was the first gas-powered uh, vehicle in the United States. But it wasn't until a few years after that, not until 1908, he produced the, not, the Model T. And the Model T, his whole dream about the Model T was that he wanted to mass-produce a vehicle that could be affordable to the family. And so he produced that. But then it, wasn't, it was still $995, too expensive. And like 30 years later, he started to distribute a car that cost $300, affordable for the modern family. Again, like you think about this, because every 16-year-old is chomping at the bit to drive a car. But less than 100 years ago, we didn't even have automobiles or roads or any of that. And all these people working behind the scenes developed these products, worked through these processes to give us the modern conveniences that we enjoy today. I'm kind of a nerd, so let me just share one more idea with you. This is kind of crazy. But um, in 1436, Johannes Gutenberg, he invented something called the printing press. Here's a picture of the printing press. Um, he invented the printing press. Listen, before 1436, there was no way for us to mass produce books, to, to replicate them. In fact, the only way that they could do that up until this time was literally to copy them by hand. And so when he came about and, and did that, he began a new age of information distribution. Think about how far we've come when it comes to that. So kind of the next thing in my mind that came along was that there was a guy, uh, his name was Charles Babbage, he invented the first mechanical computer in the early 1800s. Before there was ever electricity, he discovered how to make a mechanical computer. But then in the 1960s, maybe some of you remember this, something came along called ARPANET. Let me just read you what it means. Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. It was the first version of the internet. You think about that too, because the internet today is so, it's so integral to our society. But then in 1973, John Mitchell and Martin Cooper came along and they introduced the first handheld cell phone. And it wasn't until 10 years later that they introduced it. Here's a picture of it. It was called the Dynatex 8000X, the first cell phone introduced in 1983. I actually didn't even realize that they were, you could buy a cell phone then at that point in time, but that's when they introduced it. Now here's what's crazy. This phone, when they began to introduce it to the public, cost $3,995. You thought your cell phone was expensive. But in our day and age, if we were to buy this phone, it would cost us $12,066.83 to buy a cell phone. It's crazy. It could last for 30 minutes. It was 12 inches long, and it weighed about 2 pounds. It's crazy because right now in all of our pockets, probably in just about every pocket, we have this supercomputer that we can, we can uh, distribute information, we can receive information, we can contact one another. You think about how far we've come and the work that has been done. We just live in this world of simplicity. And that's not to mention other things that we depend on too, like refrigeration or antibiotics, medicine. You think about the, the currency that we work with, email, eBay, Facebook. Come on, you guys depend on Facebook on a regular basis. Amazon. It's crazy how many things, all the legwork that's been done for us to live in this world of simplicity. But I think uh, for me, like when I'm studying this this week, I'm, I'm feeling like this sense of gratitude. It's given me like a whole different perspective as I look at all the things that have been done, really honestly, for, for me to enjoy life the way that I do. But I think instead of us typically doing that, we instead have a tendency to feel frustrated with the inconveniences of life. So let me just ask you if you feel a sense of this. When you were driving somewhere this week, did you feel more angry about the slow people that were in front of you? Or did you feel a sense of gratitude thinking, I'm driving in an automobile? <laughs> Probably you were more angry about the people that are in front of you. Or, or what about this one? 
How many of you this week have felt angry about the slow internet? Anybody said that? Like, oh man, I can't like access what I want to. We have to reboot our routers or find somebody that knows what they're doing. We get angry about the slow internet. Instead of thinking to ourselves, we have the ability to access a super highway of information. We, we forget about the gratitude about those things. Or maybe you've walked into Target. Anybody walked into Target and seen the line that's like the entire length of the store? And thought, I actually heard somebody say this the other day. They walked in and saw that and said, I ain't standing in that line. But I, I think instead of like feeling the gratitude that we walk into a giant store that has electronics and clothes and food and all those things, instead of feeling the gratitude of the legwork that people have done for us, we feel frustration over those things, which is interesting to me. And also I think about my parents. Maybe you guys can give some perspective to you too. How much legwork that some of your parents did to change your family destiny. For me, I look at my parents' lives, and they grew up with parents that were both emotionally distant. And in their emotional distance, they didn't hear the words, I love you. They didn't hear the words, I'm proud of you. And that's just not to say exactly how, how tough it was, for, especially for my mom, to grow up. But then I look at the family where they raised us, and my brothers and I heard that we were special. We heard that we were unique. We, we were loved. Like, the, the idea of I love you was said so many times. And I think about the work that they did to create a completely different life for me and my brothers. As a teenager, I did not appreciate the work that my parents did. In fact, I often really chose to, to treat them as though I didn't appreciate it. But now as I look back, I realize there's so much legwork that they did, I forget to have the gratitude that I want to. And you think about all the different people in your life that potentially have done legwork for you. Just for a second, I want you to think about the teachers that impacted your life or the mentors that did legwork to help you become the person that you are. A little bit more distantly, maybe you think of the military, the guys who have fought for our freedom to provide us a place that we can live in a free country. You think about uh, going a little bit further back, the, the pioneers who decided to, to forge their way across this country and build civilizations for us to live in today. Or the pilgrims before them who came to an entirely new country and experienced it in a way that was very difficult, but yet they forged forward for us. You think about the early church members who probably gathered together and they were the first group of people that would sit together and risk their lives. In fact, when they would have baptisms and they would confess that they were followers of Jesus, it literally put a target on their back and they might be executed for the fact that they called themselves followers of Jesus. I think about the first disciples that came before them. All of them forging a way to offer us the ability to have access to a simpler life. But none of them, none of them paying a higher price than that of Jesus and the legwork that he did for us. And so this morning, we're inching closer to the story of Jesus' life where it's like the conclusion, the ending of what happened before he died. And as we go here this morning, I hope that as we like take a look at his story, take it apart a little bit and understand it in a deeper way, that maybe we can walk away experiencing gratitude, maybe a change in perspective. Maybe there's a life change that happens in us when we're able to look at his life and see this is the foundation we get to live on. There's a whole different view when we look at Jesus that way. Hope we walk away with some gratitude as we do so. So let's dive into it. We're going to go to Luke chapter 23. We'll just read this together and talk about it as we go. Right here at the beginning of this passage, it says, as the soldiers led him away. Now, I want to stop there because there's so much that's in this content here. Because before Jesus was ever led away in this moment, there's so much that had happened to him. You think about the emotional distress that Jesus was in in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you're not familiar with the story, that was the night when Jesus was like agonizing over the fact that he was going to give his life. And he was literally uh, sweating drops of blood. So he had that going on in his life. And then he was abandoned by his disciples. All of them who called himself his friends walked away from him and they left him. Uh, then also he went through this experience where he was taken to the home of the high priest. And that high priest uh, at at that high priest's home, he was beaten severely and insulted. He was forced to walk more than two and a half miles. And that was all before he was carrying the cross. And not only before he was led away in this moment, also he was, um, he was told by Pilate to be scourged. And scourging was a, a terrible thing that happened. 
It was something that was done for every victim of crucifixion. Before they would ever go to the crucifixion, they were always scourged. It brought them to a place of a, a very weakened state, so weak that they were just barely still alive after they were done being scourged. Dr. Uh, William Edwards, he, he wrote about this, and I thought we would read the description of how he described the scourging. It says, as the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victims back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions, and leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissues. Then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. The extent of the blood loss may have well determined how long the victim would survive on the cross. It's crazy to think that that's what Jesus went through before he ever went to the cross. In fact, after scourging, he was certainly just in a place of shock. He had been physically, mentally abused, deprived of basic needs. He'd had a sleepless night before he was ever walking in that direction. And then, as it was customary for every single person that was ever going to be crucified, they had to carry their own cross. The weight of the cross itself would have been about 300 pounds. But the victim would only be forced to carry the cross beam that they would be nailed to with their hands. And that was about between 75 and 125 pounds. And at this point, he was humiliated. He had been mutilated. The Bible actually says he was mutilated beyond recognition. He had had a, a crown of thorns beaten onto his head through his skull. And then he was naked and forced to walk through the streets of Jerusalem. And there's so much in that statement. He was led away. Because what was going on in him physically was just incredible. So let's continue. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene. He was on his way from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. This guy, Simon of Cyrene, is an interesting character that enters into the story. Um, it says he was from Cyrene. We don't know where that is uh, when we read that, but um, historically, he was actually from northern Africa, modern-day Libya. So he was like 800 miles from home. And in this moment, he was probably a pilgrim coming to Jerusalem for Passover. I don't know if maybe he stood out if the Romans were looking around in the crowd and he stuck out like a sore thumb because he was clearly a foreigner from a different place. But for whatever reason, they grabbed him. And certainly he did not want to be the guy that was going to carry the cross at this point in time, that cross was probably already covered in Jesus' blood. And so he had to pick up this cross. He probably did not want to be associated with a criminal. But they forced him to carry it behind him because Jesus was of no way to do that. And what's interesting about it is it really becomes a visual example of what it looks like to take up your cross and follow him. Simon of Cyrene took up Jesus' cross and followed him on the way to the cross. It says then, uh, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. So uh, it was always a big deal that when a crucifixion was happening, a large crowd would follow. They were invited by the Romans to experience it, to watch it, to see what was happening. And so uh, it, was, it was definitely like a public event, a public spec spectacle by the Romans. And according to custom, a person, a Roman guard would walk ahead of the person that's being crucified, and they would have a sign saying who the person was and what their crime was. And so they would walk ahead, and they always took the long way. They never took the short way to where they were going to be crucified. They wanted them to be paraded through town. So these women were standing there, they were mourning as they watched Jesus. It says, Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And I think about the extent of pain that Jesus is in. It's probably at like one of the weakest moments of his life. Certainly humiliated. Again, walking as a criminal through town, and he hears these women crying. And he has the energy to turn around. And in this moment, we also see that Jesus here, he cares for these women, 
cares for them. It's just enlightening to me to hear Jesus in the worst possible scenario still offering care for these women. But he also says, don't cry for me, cry for yourself. Cry for yourself. And I, he also said, blessed are the childless women. To understand this a little bit, we think as we were, if we could put ourselves in the framework where Jesus was, Jesus being God could see what was going to happen in the future. In 70 AD, Jerusalem fell, and when it did, women would have been glad if they didn't have children there. It was a terrible, horrific event. And maybe Jesus was peering forward through time saying, you'd be blessed in those moments to not have children. You'd prefer to not have them. And then he makes another statement. <clears throat> he says, for if these people do things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Literally meaning, if this is what they do to the innocent, what do they do to the guilty? And Jesus, knowing what he's accomplishing on the cross, he has his um, statement that he's basically saying, don't weep for the crucifixion. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your own sin. Don't weep for me in this moment. Because to weep for me now is literally to lament the remedy or, or cry about the antidote to our sin. Don't weep for your sin. I mean, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Don't lament the remedy. And then it says this. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So at this place where they began to crucify him, everyone that was there in the moment, they, they didn't need any explanation about what a crucifixion was. They'd seen it. Crucifixions were a great deterrent for lawlessness. People did not want to get caught by the Roman Empire and crucified. But for us, we don't have a whole lot of context, right? The Romans had perfected this form of torture. They brought it down to a science. And both scourging and crucifixion were part of it that made this a particularly agonizing thing to do. Because first the back was torn open, and then they covered them in a robe, and once the blood started to clot on that person's back, we'll just talk about this as Jesus because this is him. As the blood was clotting on Jesus' back, they tore the robe back off again to reopen those wounds. This was part of what they did on a regular basis to people. And after a long walk to the destination where they were going to go, they threw them on the ground, contaminating their back with dirt, probably getting rocks on their back and inside their wounds. And then they were nailed to rough, hewn wood. You think about all of that that's happening in that moment. The major effect of crucifixion was suffocation. Because the weight of our body would be pulling down. And as they, they nailed Jesus' hands to the cross, they were nailing them through the wrists, severing a, a nerve in there, probably causing his hands to be in a claw-like fashion. And then the, the, after you're nailed to the cross, the weight of your body pulls down on that. And in order to get a breath, you had to push up off of your feet and twist your arms to try and get to a place where you could actually breathe. Every single breath that Jesus took was agonizing and completely exhausting. And eventually, if someone didn't die fast enough, they broke their legs, which they eventually would do to Jesus as well. Because once your legs are broken, you can't get a breath. They actually got the English word excruciating out of this process on the cross. See, this is what blows my mind. It's in this moment when you imagine how difficult it would be hanging on a cross with your hands, your wrists nailed and your feet nailed, humiliated, beaten, beyond recognition. Jesus pulls himself up to get a breath so that he can say this next statement. Everything about this would have been incredibly agonizing to get enough air to say this. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. But you think about all the people that were there in this moment just to watch him die. You think about the, the people that were the audience, the religious zealots 
who were excited to see him on the cross, the soldiers who had just beaten him, all those people who had tried to trap him and had hate him, they were there. And I think about the people who weren't there. His support system, most of his disciples had run away and were hiding. Most of his friends were gone. Where were they? Alone, hanging on the cross, Jesus says, forgive them. What an incredible statement for him to do that because he taught us to love our enemies. But I don't think anybody thought he meant it to this extent. And on the cross, he pays for, he prays for people that none of us would pray for. For people who had mutilated, mutilated him, for people that were his enemies, he prays for me and he prays for you. And he also reveals something about his destiny, about the Messiah in this prayer that he prays. Let's see what 700 years before a guy by the name of Isaiah had prophesied what he was going to say. Let's see what he says. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for the sinners. 700 years earlier, it said the Messiah would do that. And Jesus fulfilled that destiny. You think about the legwork that he did to pave a road for us to live in the simplicity of forgiveness. That's what he did. And then it says this, this next verse, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Listen, Jesus had come down so far he made himself so poor that even his clothes that were on his back were divided by the roll of a dice. Everything that Jesus had was taken away. He made himself poor, going the entire way for us to experience forgiveness. Look at how Paul talks about this. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. I think this should change the way that we view what God has done for us. Because Jesus did the legwork. He did all the legwork for us to live in this, the simplicity. He did all the legwork for me to live in the simplicity of forgiveness. He did it all. I don't have to do anything. And so my response, remembering this and seeing this, should bring me to a place of gratitude should grip, bring me to a place of a, a new perspective, and maybe as I witness what he did with his leg roll on the cross, I should find a new life change in my heart as I walk from this place before, today. So in light of the forgiveness that he did, in light of the legwork that he put out there, I, I was just thinking, like, what, what should we do? And so I thought I would let the authors of the scripture speak for that. I thought we'd let Paul speak for that. I thought I'd let David in the Old Testament speak for what our response should be. So here's what I believe that they're telling us. Let's, let's look at Ephesians just to see what Paul says. What should I do with my forgiveness? It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according with the riches of God's grace. We have forgiveness. We have redemption. It's not something that we have to earn. It's not something I got to make God love me for. We have it. We already have it. I just think this is an incredible thing that Jesus did all the legwork on the cross. I don't have to do anything. We have forgiveness. Paul talks about this as he's talking to the church in Colossae. He says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I think about this idea of the dominion of darkness. These Californian people that were in their homes covered in snow couldn't see, right? They're in this dominion of darkness. And they wrote, help us. And then somebody comes and rescues them from the dominion of darkness that they were living in. And they're not in it anymore. We're not in the dominion of darkness anymore. We have redemption. We have forgiveness of sins. Paul talks, or David talks about this in the Old Testament. And when we read this psalm, he said, you, O Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call out to you. I think this is super important. Because he says you're forgiving and good, abounding in love. That's definitionally who God is. We sang about this this morning. 
God is love. But it's also, he makes this reference to all who call out to you. The idea is forgiveness is ours. All we need to do is accept what he's done for us. That's it. It's given. It's paved the way. All the work is done. All I need to do is receive it. In fact, in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says it this way. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. I look at that and I think, okay, God sees everything, but he's treating me when I'm forgiven like he doesn't even remember my sin. That when he looks at me covered in the blood of Jesus, he doesn't even see my sin anymore. So here's the perspective I think that I'm getting from these scriptures as I read it, that we need to embrace the forgiveness that we've been offered. Embrace it and live in it. It's like a warm blanket that can wrap around us. We can bask in the fact that we have been given forgiveness. He doesn't even remember our sins anymore. So if you've come here this morning and you're like, hey, I have never received that forgiveness. This is new information to me. I've never even heard that that's what God did for me. Then this morning, I just want to invite you. Jesus literally offers us the opportunity to have a forgiven relationship with him where our sin is done, where God doesn't remember it anymore. And the only response that we have as human beings on the planet is to say, I accept what Jesus has done for me on the cross. So this morning, we invite you to accept what Jesus has done. And if you've already accepted what Jesus has done, then in this moment, let me ask you to embrace that forgiveness, to live in the simplicity and enjoy the life and the peace that comes with knowing that you're forgiven. We have it. But I think there's one more response. For me, as a follower of Jesus, I think I see another thing that kind of bubbles up in the scripture. I thought we'd actually see what Jesus says about this. One more idea. So watch yourself. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Watch how far he goes. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must Forgive them. See this other concept about Jesus, right? He, he spoke these words, and then he did what he did on the cross. He lived it. He walked it. He breathed it. So followers, we're called to something more than just the way that the normal world acts. He says when someone sins against you, if they come to you seeking forgiveness, give it to them. Even if they screw up, and you're like, hey, I already forgave you. I, just, I forgave you five times today. He's like, listen, even if they come to you seven times and ask for repentance, give it to them. Give them forgiveness. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians about this idea. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Again, our example is what Jesus did on the cross. But this is where we're supposed to live in a place of giving forgiveness to each other. He says it one more way again in Colossians. He says this, bear with each other, forgive one another. If, you have a, uh, if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, always remembering the perspective of what Jesus did as he's raising himself up on the cross to speak his breath and saying, I forgive you. Father, forgive them. This is our example, that as we live, we should bask in the fact that we've been given his love. Jesus did all the legwork for me to live in the simplicity of forgiveness. The work is done. But not only should I live in it and embrace it, but I should also give it. As Jesus gave it, I should give it away. Live in the simplicity of forgiveness and give it away. That's what followers of Jesus do. Jesus, this morning, I pray that if someone is here and they're not familiar with who you are and your forgiveness is new and your grace is not something they've experienced, I pray that this morning that would become something that is a regular occurrence in their heart, that they would know how much you've loved them and how much you've forgiven them. And Jesus, we thank you that as we reflect the cross, that's what we see. We see forgiveness offered to us. Let's pray this morning that we can live in it pray this morning that we could embrace that love that you offer to all of us. So thank you, Jesus, for that. And I pray, too, that you would help me to see the world differently, 
Would you change my perspective? You'd help me to have life change. With all the work that you did for me, I pray that I would live differently. That as I respond to people who hurt me, that I give them the same grace that you offered to me. As, as you've forgiven me before you ever knew me, you knew all my life's sins. You see to play it out before you, and you forgave me for it. I pray that you'd help me to have that same forgiveness. We thank you, Jesus, for the fact that you love us like that. You call us to more. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.